41 poets, 42 poems, outdoor voices in an indoor world, volume 15. Do you know how it feels to sit in a room filled with greatness and wonder if you deserve to be there? But knowing you deserve to be there, to play Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde with feeling worthy and knowing how worthy you are. Forced to swallow that imposter of a syndrome, to posture up in rooms that seem to swallow you whole. Do you know how many stars make up the galaxy? The Milky Way is said to hold over 100 million stars. So, in the universe, said to hold over a hundred billion galaxies, I remind myself of the possibility of my twin. Yes. That I too can dance in the night sky, and if I can see it as improbable, then how can I not see it as possible? So I audacity my way into rooms, become my insecurities doppelganger, and I speak anyways. I say, hi, I'm Arlene. I become back braced to my own self-worth. I stand tall, I stare rejections, possibilities in the eyes until its barrel tunnels me into a new point of view where I become locked finger behind my own destiny's trigger, shaking hand of nerves, it's steadied by opposing hands, do it anyway, bang. No, I become the big bang. Yeah. I, I, create, I create my own galaxy of possibilities. I realize this is not a room. I'm beginning to think I do belong here, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out the star sun isn't the only star capable of shining. In fact, most stars are bigger, have their own planets, and not that based on proximity, they can be a little intimidating, but I speak anyways. I twinkle in a universe I have yet to explore. I study the galaxies that fascinate me most, and I keep twinkling, and I keep speaking. Did you know that the Earth's closest star seen by the visible eye is 270,000 times the distance of that between the Earth and the Sun? See, I learned that we see the stars and planets as they were minutes, even hours ago, that when we see the Sun, we're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. But back to that star. Every time we see it, we're seeing it as it was four years ago, even at the speed of light that travels through time. So I speak to my past self. From my future mindset, from all that I can be, and I say, if you can see the galaxy, you are the uncertainty of this universe would yeah, matter so on. much. So head up, shoulders back, stand tall. Even if you don't feel worthy, you are into this room and speak into this universe and create your own galaxy. New ones are discovered every day. So I show up and I speak anyway. A welcoming from the angel of tourism. There is a small ounce of space on the mole that rests above the god of my understanding's lip where the dead and the unborn gather once the stars have settled. Mythic beasts of detriment and dare, tonguing the lucid river that cuts through this land of origin. Call it Eden, call it hell, depending on whom you ask. The place one goes when the last of the fight crawls from their mouths. Look closer at some of the wild things that roam under this hibiscus sky. Open wholly, so you can bear witness to the story of a new god a triple moon god. Watch as she creates entire galaxies with a pinch of sugar and the emptiness of a promise. You can do this too, you know. Be an alchemist, a saint, a good daughter. Turn choice into reckoning, history into splayed hip bones carving up the darkest parts. If you are ready to know salvation at the cost of a most merciless truth, because everything has a price, my dear, then come and Sever little body from self, 
leave little body dancing by the river and self running towards the last atomic moon. Colonialists don't care. It's not the name on the map, but the riches on the terrain that inspire the expedition. Conquistadors don't care. The map will be redrawn and carved in the flesh of natives coerced to mining their own land. Pirates will not be noble. They will backstab and snitch, sink their own ships to hide their claim, every mineral and craft, every treasure and slave. The missionaries will be godless, except for the commerce they facilitate. God bless the golden collection plate, and damned is the heathen that does not comply. So when your future is present, the museum is full, the truth becomes myth, be fable. Be reclamation, you warriors, you artisans, you doctors and farmers' descendants, and don't allow the fraudulent voices of history to keep lying. The old joke goes, patient walks into the doctor's office, says, doctor, it hurts when I move my arm like this. What should I do? And the doctor says, so don't move your arm like that. Now, fat girl walks into doctor's office, says, doctor, it hurts when I move my arm like this. What should I do? And the doctor says, have you considered weight loss surgery? Fat girl walks into the doctor for a flu shot and gets a lecture about BMI. Fat girl walks into the doctor's with an earache and gets asked if she's ever eaten a salad. Fat girl walks into the doctor's office with a spider bite and the doctor obsesses over how low her blood pressure is. Low for such a fat person anyway. Insists on checking it three times before he'll believe it. Forgets completely about the mass of purple spider venom that brought her here to begin with. Fat girl walks into the doctors to ask about antidepressants and gets prescribed exercise instead because obviously her depression is because of her fat and obviously fat bodies never exercise and stay fat. Fat girl walks into the doctor's office for a standard three-month follow-up appointment and the doctor says, have you considered that weight loss surgery yet? Fat girl gets tired of constantly being diagnosed as fat. So fat girl stops walking into the doctor's office. Fat girl walks into the world and says, world, it hurts to exist like this. And the world says, so stop existing like that. Fat girl walks through a world that would rather she slice herself open than to exist as she does. Side effects be damned. Fat girl walks through a world overrun with sidewalk doctors who claim to be concerned concerned about her health side effects be damned fat girl walks into the world and still somehow manages to love her fat body and the world says Stop glorifying obesity. Fat girl walks into the world and says I do not owe you shrinking you know I do not owe you thinness Attempted thinness or desired thinness because you assume thinness equals health. For that matter, I do not owe you health perceived or otherwise to receive basic respect. I am deserving of care. I am deserving to exist as I do. I am deserving of first, no harm done. And the world says that is the best joke we've heard all day.
Love can be so sick. It can be so sinister. But it could all be so simple if only it were you. Love could be so new. It could be so rare, like limited edition, like a new pair of sneakers. I would wear our love every day and somehow I would never wear it out, but I would always wear it out. I would only go outside once coated in a thick layer of our love. I would just bathe in it till I grew gills and then I would swim in our love endlessly. Whether I'm drifting off or lifting off, I would peacefully suffocate my lungs inside our love and somehow I bet I would never lose breath. I bet it would be so freeing, but love can be so sick. It can be so sickening. If you love something, you protect it, but you also let it go. If you love something and you set it free, that implies it was in your possession. But if it's possession, then it's not love. So do I love you or do I want you to myself? These thoughts are why I don't just keep all my love to myself, but keeping all this love to myself is exactly what keeps me up at night, ironically. I even write about you in my sleep, seldom as it comes. Love can be hideous, but you are beauty. Loving you is easy because you're beautiful. You're my beloved. I'm your biggest fan, so whenever you don't have time, I find it for you, even at the cost of my own patience, because you are an experience worth waiting for. And even though I want you to myself right now, I guess the world just will experience you more. I just hate feeling saved for last because you know I love you more, right? Love can lack so much sympathy sometimes. How can I say that I love you when I associate so much negativity with love itself? I keep it to myself so I can fix it up for you. Love could be so polished. It could be so pristine. But it could all be perfectly sobering. But pursuing someone as opportunist as you requires me to evolve first. And I'm willing to level up for our love. And I'll spend all my XP on our love. I look forward to loving you as if it's right before my eyes. I look forward to loving you like I have some kind of foresight, but love can be so blinding when we don't keep in contact, so your contact in my phone will always be beloved, because as ugly as love can be, love could be so us. Boom. All right. Let's go. Mark and set. One, two does not guarantee three. Let us go. Perhaps if we delete contractions, dissuade abbreviations, discourage any swallowing of letters. We don't always know the strength of clenched around our hands, tight around what we believe, what we think, what we think we think we know especially if our knowing is only holding on, hanging on tight. Let's go. Step into the process of moving onward. Go. Let us remind ourselves that our sunrises move smooth through our horizons and they fall. The sun collapses again and again. Let us again and again go again and again. Thank you. Anna Somerset. Albanian lament for Doreen. Drop fed ice shavings like the orchids she adores. Doreen is breathing for England, crackling, constant interference like she were a radiogram broadcasting from 1950s Albania. Started yesterday, lamentations on hold. Visitors have not arrived yet to see this 90 year old bloom. My sister and I hurling kisses of life like she were Briar Rose. Long dead dad cranes his neck from the bench outside. He'd been jumping and gurning, mum said when she could speak. His patience sorely challenged this month of June. Robin had come to visit the house four times already, but still came much too soon. Uh, 
an incomplete list of men I will eat <laughs> when the patriarchy finally falls. Amen. Amen. One, George Zimmerman. Amen. <laughs> Marinated in lemon, <laughs> salt, vinegar, oven scrapings. He will be as acrid as the sweetness he plucked from this world. Mm -hmm. We will dance through the pucker. Mm -hmm. Two, Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Prepared buffet style on live television. <laughs> Each bite of production the opposite of miracle. 5,000 women still wanting after his last rib is picked clean. Wow. Three, Larry Nassar. Amen. Tenderized <laughs> repeatedly, yes. <laughs> rolled into pristine cutlets, flipped through egg wash and breadcrumbs, fried. Amen. Four. Louis C.K. Amen. <laughs> paired only with his own aftertaste. You swear <laughs> the flavor is almost funny. <laughs> Five. Blake Shelton. I, I don't really have anything against it. <laughs> it's just that with Gwen Stefani this far up his ass, that's nearly a turducken. <laughs> Six. Elon Musk. Yes! yes. yes. Salt the tears of his sycophantic circle jerk fanboys. His bones will be condensed into emeralds that we launch into space just for funsies. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. paired with milk, cause too rich. Yeah. <laughs> Eight, George Rohde, <laughs> you, you don't know him. <laughs> I need you to trust me. <laughs> Nine, Mitch McConnell, Amen. prepared soup style in his own shell. <laughs> Crusted with 45 Cheetos, the FBI will provide take out boxes. 10, the next man. The next man who does not speak the language of enough. Mm. The next man who draws blood from one of my sisters. The next man who takes what is not freely offered. Mm. Pit roasted. Open flame. A feral nest of bitches. There will be now. nothing left. Mm. Not even the story. Yeah. Not even the bones. Mm. Woo! Growing up, I always had a tendency to end up doing the things I hate the most. My least favorite part of wrestling practice was running. I would walk the part of the indoor track that people couldn't see until match days held me accountable. Track coaches always wanted me to run hurdles. I never once made the team. All those talks made my avoidance of the leaps in life become more than metaph metaphoric. I used to look at track as a pointless sport. Recently, I've been in a space where the lines are always blurred, searching for salvation in the bottom of a bottle or on the back end of a blunt, trying to find a message in a mushroom, if you will, moving mountains, trying to find answers in the world around me. Most times I seek solace outside of sobriety. I used to believe that if I didn't acknowledge my grief, that it didn't exist. I wouldn't even go to therapy until I realized I've been on an infinite need as long as I could breathe, constantly yearning for the next morning, yet the sunrise always has its way of running for me. I spent 10 hours a night chasing in the place I hate. Reality is never quite as I like it. My father always has a saying that he drinks once in the morning and a while at night. I always wonder what he spends his days avoiding. Most likely it's coping or grieving or moving on or maybe life after. He was never much for forward thinking. My mother's death was very sudden. I doubt before it actually happened that he even ever considered that it would. Nothing is ever real until it happens. And even then, reality is subjective. I'm a father now. I always find myself in a constant state of simultaneous reflections and observations, the parallels of my sons, finding his way in this world, the intricacies of my daughter's emotions. My son takes me every day for a week straight, excited about a Thanksgiving visit. That same weekend, my father reminded me that he has cancer. The first time that he said it, I completely blocked it out. It wasn't the reality that I wanted. 
The thing causing this very sickness is currently my biggest vice. I look my mortality in the eyes, knowing the fate that awaits, and I still won't quit. I'm an addict. It's probably my first time admitting it. I already feel my air getting thinner. I don't want to be the dad having to gasp from wind from playing with my kids. The more I see myself and my pops, the more I want to stop. But during this writing, he was in an accident. He broke four ribs. Roaming them streets near Lake Erie always has his way of taking the wind out your sails. Lights hit me with some lows, and I had the broken spirit to match. I guess we both in our healing phases. How do I keep my kids from getting stuck? This got to be the last time my personal hurdles can't become the same demons that my kids wrestle with in adulthood or carry the sins of their father that got their own crosses to bear. Perhaps I've crucified myself enough mentally. If the wages of my children's freedom is the death of my bad habits, then I have no qualms paying the fare. Meanwhile, I just want to steady my mind enough to have compassion so that my mini-me's don't become another mirror image so they don't have to keep experiencing the living hell or find themselves like their grandpops and their father simply just running parallels. My name is Sinchari. Not Sincheri, Sinchara, Sally, just Sinchari. No matter how many times I correct you, you've chosen your own linguistic comfort over my identity because any name that deviates outside of your limited vocabulary makes you uncomfortable. So I let you continue to dehumanize me to preserve your comfortability through silence that hides my agitation and ostracization that has caused this genocide of generations in the form of assimilation with sandwiches for lunch instead of biryani. Celebrations for Christmas instead of Diwali, speaking English instead of Bengali, changing our names to Mali, all to embody the characteristic of the colonizers who see us as invaders of the land and people they stole. And despite this genocide of generations that silently wipes out civilizations until all that's left is propaganda taught as our history, I've been told not to speak up and correct others because maybe then I would be seen as an equal deserving of respect. Instead, I've been reduced to being lesser than a dog whose name gives them humanity, but strips mine of my sanity when being told I should become Sally if I ever want to be happy. I don't ever want to be content to as being misidentified or forcefully consume cyanide in the name of peace to abolish all that makes you uncomfortable. So listen to me when I tell you my name is Sinchari. Not Sincheri, Sinchara, Sally. Just Sinchari. Potential love. I fall for the potential love I see that you could give me. Tugging on my heartstrings to the point I convince my brain that everything is reality. No effort, no actions. But your words reel my soul so much. I'm blinded to your actions that never held up to your words. Trauma so deep surrounding your love that the mere thought of what you could give me holds my open heart over for the night. What a surprise. It was lies. Lies held my insecure heart stay open as if my love was just like a restaurant window with the open sign brightly lit with no customers in the seats. Only a waiter behind the counter ready to take an order for love, hoping the love that was served to them was enough to satisfy the customer. But no, my love was never good enough, or maybe you weren't good enough. I still have hope, yet hope has left my heart shattered, but my mind open for more potential love. I get such a bad rap. When my name enters your mind, it exits your mouth in a snarl, a snide smirk, a chastising chuckle. Uh, <laughs> could it be me? Uh, I can't believe he'd do that. You say I was fake from the start. 
That that snake never had to enter my heart. That he was there from the jump. You jumped to my conclusions as if I had this plan from the opening chapter. Funny. You have access to the entire book. So you choose to write my story. Judas. The. Betrayer. Leave it up to you. That's all I'll ever be. Judas. The. Betrayer. You forget that I was a disciple first. He was my friend before you ever heard of him. I walked with him long before I ever stood against him. And I was selected. Handpicked. I was chosen by your Savior before he ever completed the task of securing your salvation. You forget that you and I both do the, both do the same thing. Throw dirt on Jesus' name with our actions. Or, you know what? Maybe you don't forget. Maybe you choose to intentionally leave it out because you're more of a Peter, right? Heated for Jesus, hot-tempered and down for anything, but you could never deny him, could you? Or maybe you're more of a John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. You do realize he gave himself that nickname, right? I mean, what kind of loser gives himself his own nickname, but you just the same with your Jesus loves me, this I know him. Well, he loved me too, and I was one of the first anyways he decided to love because he knew what I would do and he chose to love me anyway, but you so John with it though. <laughs> you be the one of the base of the cross too, huh? The only disciple who remained. You be without stain, wouldn't you, huh? A standalone example of for all of us to follow or the proper way to love Jesus, you'll get the revelation too, right? But not, the, but not the torture that came with it. Let you write your story. You'd be the perfect Christian. But give a permanent marker to another author and watch what happens. See, it makes sense, y'all. It makes sense why I never got a book. You'll never see the gospel according to Judas Iscariot in your Bible. See, I didn't stick around long enough to hear the good news. All I heard was ropes tying and creaking. I heard necks breaking, throats, natural flows being stopped. I heard skin tightening and I heard breath struggling to escape from a chest that was truly broken. But what it let inside his heart, he was crafty. He fooled me too. But am I stupid enough to expect pity from a group of people that blame Eve for getting tricked too? See, you too smart for that, ain't you? You never sit before. Never turned your back on him. Never closed the door. No, I'm the only one to commit such a heinous crime. Yes, I'm the sacrifice. Not like our friend. But I sacrificed my reputation. Gave up my side of the story so that you could see glory as I took the fall. And I didn't even have a choice in the matter. You know, it breaks my heart to know that I was destined to break hearts. So I guess that's how it was so easy for Satan to enter my heart. He just walked through the cracks. And now, you get to sit back and curse my name. Neglecting the fact that we both betrayed Jesus. We just do it through different acts. And I didn't have to write your story for you to know that much is true. I recently saw a quote, but there was no author listed. It read, Sometimes among us are the ones who smile through the silent pain, cry behind closed doors, and fight battles nobody knows about. My next poem, Check on Your Strong Friends, addresses mental health issues and concerns. One in five Americans experience a mental illness in a given year, and sometimes it impacts those that we least expect. So let's all be compassionate and kind to each other because we never know what another person is going through. It's called Check on Your Strong Friends. <laughs> I 
I mean, it kind of just crept up on me from out of nowhere. Slowly but surely, like thick cold molasses oozing its way from a frigid jaw. Moment by moment, day by day, the joy I once knew began to elude me, slipping further away from the corner of close and closer to the intersection of but yet so far. But see, this emotional opponent is not unknown to me. It has, without invitation, visited me before at other times. With no regard to the energy it takes or the destruction it makes, it has found a place in the only space in this whole entire world that is truly mine and that is in my mind. And depression ain't trying to make no good impression. It has no boundaries and has no chill and it does not wait with its wayward ways. It's there waiting for me from the moment I wake. It places weight at the start of my day when I'm just trying to find my way. So I pray because everybody needs me. I got fires to put out, tall buildings to leap. There is no such thing as taking a pause for the cause that is me. I got to strap on my superwoman cape that's been passed down to me from my ancestry, along with a mask that is custom made just for me. Each one contoured specifically to conceal, not heal the scars my soul can feel so deep of the naked eye cannot see. And even though I try to forget them after all this time, painful memories come back and replay themselves over and over again in my mind. I fight to stay present, but invisible ties keep me mentally traveling back in time to people and places and things that changed me. Now I'm off creating fantasies about how life would be if things had went down differently. I guess I'm still waiting on God to grant me that serenity. But would I even recognize it if he gave it to me? So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my reality. And the survey says I cannot let reality show. I got to make my face ready to face the world with my superwoman cape on and my matching mask and toe because being secretly depressed is fine. But when it shows now, I'm just a black woman who's angry. But now it's starting to feel like this faking until I make a facade is evolved into a destructive way of escaping. So I just keep hiding the fact that I can't manage my life, my home, and my emotions. I just keep showing happy, smiling posts of all my productivity. Knowing deep down inside I can't feel a thing. I'm just checking off boxes and going through the motions. I have somehow managed to get lost in my own body. I want to run away from myself, but there's nowhere to go. Convincing everyone that I am on cloud nine, but I'm really just lost in the fog, praying that nobody knows. I simply want to feel again, dance in the rain again, taste, touch, and smell everything that I do. So when flowing backstroke through the waves of life, instead of feeling like I'm drowning in a cesspool. But how does the one who's the life of the party admit that they're dying and slide nice and slow? How do I admit that I have mentally slipped so far from grace when I'm the one who's everybody's hashtag goals? But perhaps everyone else doesn't matter because I'm the only one that has to live with me. I've been running from myself for so long and I'm so tired. This is not the way I want my life to be. So I may have to step away from the lights and the cameras and the action for a minute because truth healing ain't posted on the gram nor is it televised. It ain't pretty, it ain't sexy, but for all of us to see, so viewer discretion will be advised. And then I will remember how powerful I am, learn how to set my mind and soul free, put on my superwoman cape one more time, but this time the person that I will be saving will be me. A poem of self-love. I'm turning 20 tomorrow. To be honest, there were many times in my life that I never thought I would make it this far. 20 is a difficult age. No longer a teen, but still not old enough for respect as an adult. Not old enough for the fun of a Friday night out of the bars with the boys. But turning 20 comes with more than just downsides. Turning 20 is a rite of passage. Hitting double digits for the second time in my life somehow feels a little less magical than when I was a kid. But why can't it be magical? In my 20 years of life on this hopeless little floating blob that we call a planet, I've come face to face with the things that make me beautiful as well as the ones that make me ugly. 
And now, today, on this day of July 15th, in the year of our Lord 2023, I choose to highlight the parts that make me beautiful. Because in my 20 years of life, I now challenge myself to find at least 20 things that make me unique, weird, and more human than anything else. One, I love the rain so much that I sleep in my car on extremely rainy nights to enjoy the sound of it hitting the roof. Two, it has taken me 20 years, and pardon my French, to truly not give a fuck what anyone thinks of me. Three, I pick and choose which parts of myself to trust other people with, and typically choose the weirdest parts, because if they accept me after that, they can take anything I can throw at them. Four, I'm truly one of the least judgmental people that I know, and with everything that is within me, I hope that it stays that way. Five, I love hearing people talk about things that they're passionate about, even if I have no clue what they're talking about. Six, I find nature the most beautiful thing on this planet. I love stargazing and taking pictures of the sky. Seven, I could spend hours in the woods, climbing trees, hiking, and watching animals, if I had the time. Eight, I've loved reading since I was little, and even though my time has dwindled through the years, I make sure to pick up a book as often as I can. Nine, I love the Lord and believe that he tells us to love and respect everyone, and I practice that in my own life. Ten, I love and hate humanity all at the same time. When I come across something that causes me to lose faith in it, it won't be long until I come across humans in their most wholesome and kind form that restores it. 11. I've always wanted to be part of something bigger than myself and to help people, and I hope I never lose that draw. 12. I feel a deep connection with people, not just my close friends and family, but with people I've just met. 13. I love caring for people. It's something I've been doing since I was a teen with my siblings, and it's carried on to my adult life. 14. Being single is my happy place. It's taken me a while to realize that this is something I like about myself, and even though I'm in a thriving relationship at the moment, I still value my alone time most of all. 15. I love to stay busy. I always have to be doing something, and if I'm not, I'm fully aware that I am not. Some people don't like this about me, but I love this drive that I hold in myself. 16. I hate wasting food. I'm always the one who brings home the leftovers. 17. I didn't realize until I moved nine hours away from them how much of a family-oriented person that I am. 18. My passion for poetry since I was a little kid. 19. I always have to be watching or listening to something, usually music. And finally, 20. I am wholly and wonderfully myself, even when that's not who I wanted to be. God made him a poet. Translation pouring out every trauma. Manipulated to make this stage and all he dies here. Translation. Paradise of every therapist. His mind is their playground. Never seeing someone use words as a noose. Hangman, each letter suspends his limbs like strange fruit, these strange truths, sacrificing his sanity to tell you these broken. His soul's corpse captures you on this coffin. You call it a stage. He calls it conception to his crucifix, crushed. His body lays broken on the page, using tears to baptize the fragmented remains, exchanging peace of mind for pocket change, locked behind bars, writing his own sentence. Prays to pull the plug on his penmanship, he cries. Let me be a doctor. Instead of making incisions in my heart's artery, splicing he who speaks to draw art, let me master matters of the mind instead of masterminding writing fables of how life matters. Let me be an actor who finds solace in make-believe, cloaks themselves in another's shoes to seal their own souls like Jonah. He tries to run to the belly of the beast, but God made him a poet. Translation. Pulling out every tear and turning it to calligraphy and artists. Produces relations of pain as his palate. Dabbing the paint brush in brutalities to paint pictures Picasso couldn't fathom. His soul is phantom, so anthems of alleviation. But you let them pass with him on the page like every prophet. He wrote his pieces, his revelations through a joint. 
used his remains as an ashtray, he prays. This pen, this sword, this sight will be the last God gave. This stage was a sepulcher. Secret sirens serenaded in similes, concealing agony and alliteration, he hopes. Metaphors mask his mental state. He tries to escape, but God made him a poet. Translation. Person ordained, enduring tribulation. Trick to treat this stage as an altar, he dies here. Mortal man clasps, clinging to God's garment, hoping to restore order. But there's no resurrection on the third day he lays. Mm. Sacrificing his sanity for impaired cochleas. Could it coax them to listen if he tried? He tries. Sewing the world together with broken lines, threading pieces to save you from your demise. But God made him. Oh, how to save him. The world's weight was never his pence to bear. This is not a poem, it's a trigger warning. Nobody move. A device strapped tightly to my chest. It is intricately designed to let off intense vibrations when triggered. The detonator is in the hands of anybody I like get close to me. And if you push that button, you better be ready for the consequences. This device is also known as a heart. And each vessel is a narrow path that connects to the rage of my emotions. It beats. It beats. Like an explosion of anxious attachment and my reaction is to gear up in seconds for protection using weapons of mass dysfunction. I cock back and go into combat mode of learned behavior and I'm ready to lay down anybody who challenges my trauma. Where is your bulletproof vest when you tested me? You see I am stubborn like a mule or a brick wall that most people were used to running into without warning. I spew aggression out of fear that my feelings won't be validated. Unexpected gaslighting has set a place to my nervous system now engulfed in flames and I can't extinguish, I mean distinguish what memories to save and which ones to let burn. But when the smoke clears, I hope you can finally see what the inside of a warrior looks like. I hope you can see the depths of darkness beyond the ashes, the ugly places I've had to crawl out of to see God's light. To remember and men fight that my blessings don't need a blood sacrifice, I'm triggered. But if I'm being honest, I'm afraid. So I train, train day in and odd hours of the night to be ready for a fight or a flight because I fear the role I have played in my suffering for years of not knowing how inner child issues disrupt the roots of my tap water relationships. They die before they ever grew. Tainted by time wasted unknowingly, I have closed books and skipped chapters that I needed to read through. Leaving stains of regret on old pages and words left unsaid, I hoarded stories that I needed to grieve. I sought shelters instead of answers, choosing isolation instead of healing because the pain ran so deep it had calluses on its feet. Marathons of hurt that felt never ending, sweat dripping in my eyes, blinding my vision. I can't see past my own feelings. I'm triggered. I am still coming to terms with slow and sudden deaths. What is cancer compared to violence? Both equally destructive to my emotional regulation and numb. Stuck between telling myself that they belong to me when they belong to God. The lies I tell myself in order to survive my control issues of trying to decide my life's outcomes. I have wasted so much time not living because I'm triggered. And you, you keep forcing me to grow. In my most hardened states, you invite me to be soft. I never felt this way before. So expose you. Peel back layers I didn't even know existed and patch the emptiness with grace. You created an elevated floor for healthy communication, dismembering my childhood's dysfunction and what I've known to be normal. You offer a quiet space for loud grief. Reminding me that it's okay to embrace who I am and acknowledge my insecurities without shame. For the first time, I sat alone and owned every bit of my issues. 
I cried through so many boxes of tissues, trying to find the reasons why I have cut so deeply. Wounds left open for spiritual cleansing. I have grown to accept the sensitive parts of me. All because you heard me in ways that caused the little girl in me to smile wide and dream big of all the ways that she deserves to have ease after experiencing so much pain and understanding that my needs are never too much for the right people. Rediscoveries of self, you came just as I was on the edge of a cliff, pleading for peace and clarity. I found my missing link, and I wish I could say this was leading to a love story, but I'm just really grateful to be a black woman in therapy. Paul. Sent on ships with shark rancorous crews that beat human beings until blood bombarded the decks. My stolen, worry swollen brethren defied tragedy's tide and revivified pride by surviving. Years of lash and gash, chattel anguish inspired ire comparable to hellfire. In between the sorrow, and plots to deal thraldom a death blow. My prayer sending brethren defied tragedy's tide and revivified pride by surviving. Raging pages of centuries turned and keen hateful conflicts burned, revealing uncivil evil, a republic's upheaval. Even so, my burden beset brethren defied tragedy's tide and revivified pride by surviving. Across that battered habitat, beings and things shook and took soldiers to disaster-laid graves, but my brethren's value-engraved resource, courageous will, was saved. Again, they defied tragedy's tide and revivified pride by surviving. No matter the conflict's length, my brethren possessed a mountain strength. I am only one voice, tiny, timid, trembling. I am only one voice. Nobody would hear me. I am only one voice. I won't be understood. I am only one voice, and the problem is overwhelming. I am only one voice, often neglected. I am only one voice, a little speck in the big world. I am only one voice. What difference can I make? I am only one voice. But I am not alone. I am only one voice. One voice is always the start. I am only one voice. But my voice matters. I am only one voice. I, I will speak, speak louder. louder. I am only one voice. I will make them listen. I am only one voice. But we only have one planet. We are one voice, no longer tiny. We are one voice, no longer timid. We are one voice, sometimes still trembling. I, I am only, only one, one voice. voice. Amplifying others you choose not to hear. I am only one, one voice. voice. Trying to save our one planet. I, I am only one, one voice. voice. No longer alone. I am only one voice. voice. Home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is, so pardon my lack of hospitality, hugs and kisses, this is not a home. This is not where you belong. 
This is not where the window's warm breath tickles the skin. This is where love and happiness are begging to be let in, but the previous owner has painted over every window frame and therefore they will remain shut until the next tenant comes in and decides to strip them down or rather knock them out. This house may be built of brick and mortar, but sticks and stones still hurt. These foundations set in rotten earth can only bear but so much weight. Wait around for the next storm to tear off every shutter, blow open every door, relocating insides, outside, leaving a landscape, seeking boundaries beyond the built environment. A bed remains for someone to lie in and be reminded that a house is begging for bodies, but a home is begging for someone to belong. Blood, sweat, and tears to water the lawn. See, a home will wait for the right heart to come along, but a house, a house, a house is simply seeking a beat. Okay. A pair of feet to come stomping in, looking for a place to sleep. It wouldn't offer you a seat, but a home would offer you a hug before offering you a plate to eat offer you shelter, offer you heat in that house. That house is still just another spot on my street. You know what I mean? A house belongs to the streets, but a home belongs to me, or rather I to her, or them, or it. Well, you catch my drift. But sometimes the ground shifts, and that's why I'm so pensive, so apprehensive, why I boarded up these windows with torn down fences. Ask the house why it's only warm when the rent's in. Ask new floorboards why they creak under tension and ask the home why it seems all our problems will be gone with just a little elbow grease. A tap of the hammer, a jiggle of the handle, and we're back in action stacking cinder blocks on second stories cause these grounds won't shake, these hounds can't break through bonded trauma, not off the hairs of my chinny chin chin. If danger creeps in, it's surely been invited. Need you not remind it to shut the door behind it, it's not here to stay. It only shows its face to place fear in our hearts. And I just wanted to know that love lives here in all parts of this home. I think I might belong to. You know, I make a living drawing buildings, but even I can't create the place that I move on to. So I move on to every place till a space is created for me. I walk up to every door and I'll turn every key till I walk in and feel safe to breathe. Safe to believe, safe to be, and most of all, safe to see the reflection in my bedroom window, a version of me that feels at home. The way to experience grief is to come back to yourself. This is a love poem to the dark. I have trembled, been helpless to its touch. These walls hem me in, envelop me, a soul for fog. Moments so slow, my breathing, it could be the death of me. Take my life and wring it to its only natural conclusion. The ground slips from under me every step. Another heartbeat slips out from my breast. I sit on the edge of the bed, just breathing in, then out, knowing the water of the ocean keeps coming, regardless of the drought, breathing in, then out. Breaths, messy, chalk-covered painting, it's not weird. The hot of regret, cold of refusal, washing like waves, this is a love poem to the light. So constant, brilliant, beckoning, hiding. Shadows are deepest when light shines the brightest. Grief shows up when I least expect it. It's okay when I only sense the light somewhere out there waiting. When I am ready, it is there whispering, hey, this is a love poem within holy, sheer willing to stay open to the possibility that this time I will not die. Complete, unrequited longing. Love is not as much a rival as a stay within the tide. Mountains only move when the heart behind them is unaffected by the outcome of their movement. Earth shifts only when no one is paying attention. This is a love poem to cycle, 
Cicada song sounds in the trees. The crushed shell on the sidewalk no longer needs filling. Metamorphoses are all around. Even breath flowers into the rebuilding of every ounce of a body. Cocoon caterpillar releases into primordial mush. From whence wings are formed, there is nothing Instagrammable about this process. Souls feel the burn as they transcend. This is a love poem to myself. I have been afraid of the dark, faced grief to find dawn emerging a sliver of pink along the tree line after the deep blue covering of night, graceful strength in the fight out of the encasement. I see courage to fight wings back into the light. Let stars guide the formation of the flight body. This is a love poem to beautiful waking perched bedside breathing ocean washing mirror longing to knowing more about love than i do about trusting myself to say so grief the deep that turns ends into beginnings Don't call me sexy. I am a person with a personality and feelings, not a pound of flesh to test your lame strokes or insatiable thirst on. So when I walk by and your alternate brain tugs at you, begging you to spew some condescending, sexually objectifying, rapist-like comments, count to ten and then shut up. To the random teenage boys with blabber mouth. To the loose young adult male. To the elderly men who are a testament to the fact that old doesn't always equal wise. To the boys or men somewhere in between who let their dangling third limb do the thinking and speaking. Don't call me sexy. Cat calling me in the middle of the streets only to haul insults at me for getting self-conscious and briskly walking past. Pardon me, cause this is my only defense against a pack of wolves quickly turning sweet names like sexy baby, honey, darling to Asheo, slut to ugly thin thing or flat as a wall six o'clock body. But as I said already, Old doesn't always equal wise and that explains why a man thrice my age would try to slip his arms around me in a cab just to grab a hold of my right breast mistakenly. My dress sense now revolves around what the safest option might be per location cause surviving another day is way more important than looking good. Eureka! Large dresses must be the answer but oh no! There comes another. Speaking of how women who cover their bodies from head to toe are freaks in bed, taking time out to explain his unsolicited and invasive deepest, darkest fantasies. Where can I run to? Who will believe the atrocities thrown at me daily, despite having a face that boldly reads, do not trespass. I step out of my home every single day consumed by the fear of objectification only to get blamed for people's actions I have no control over. Maybe your dress was too short. Maybe your clothes clung a little too tight or your hair was seductive. Maybe your makeup was too flashy or you smiled a little too much. And the award winning, are you sure you didn't seem like you were begging for it? This is not a feminist poem, but a plea from a woman tired of sexual objectification. Thank you. Hello, I'm Edward Lyon. What price of Winston Churchill's greatest legacy, the European Convention on Human Rights? We must stop these immigrants coming here and stealing our jobs and our homes away. The universal cry of all who fear they'll miss out, so wish to keep them at bay. It doesn't seem to occur to these folk. Each one of us is of immigrant stock, and our ancestors were in the same boat as they whose entrance we now wish to block. 
Pull up the drawbridge as we all right. What a disgraceful concept that is. Deny all others a chance that they might have lives as great as the lives we now live. New blood is vital for us to succeed, and good governments care for all in need. So, I really don't think I'm a good writer. I mean, I can write a couple of slick verses, rehearse it, hope I relay the tone of the piece correctly, pray that y'all get my message directly or, or indirectly. I scan my dictionary at the source, searching for words others have never heard in hopes to impress you with my false knowledge. Hide my GED and make you swear I went to college, because I swear I can't just write I have to research terminology and vernacular so I'm up all night. Cause I need y'all to like the phrases I form but be warned that I don't know what half my words really mean so the context may not hit you like I really needed to get you. <laughs> so I choose to aggrandize my spoken lyrics so that my mental aptitude becomes palpable to those who hear it. <laughs> This defenestration of my actual adeptness as a literary novice is a necessity to me because I'm doing with this writer's insecurity. And I desire for you to understand the exegesis of this situation and hope that my exclamation and explanation gives you a revelation into why my lyrical content is what it is because I swear I can't just write. I have to research terminology and vernacular so I'm up all night. I found an 11 syllable word and almost had a climactic moment that came from just knowing that y'all would be impressed with my verbal capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I have this insatiability for my dictionary. And I don't really care if the words fit shit. It's not like y'all gonna know what they mean either. I mean, <laughs> neither you or me will wear Jeopardy. So it's like my, not like my secret is in Jeopardy because I swear I can't just write. I have to research terminology and vernacular so I'm up all night. So I get the word where I can fit the word and I spit the word and proclaim myself to be an anti-disestablishmentarianist. <laughs> That's 11 syllables. I'm smart as shit. <laughs> at least I hope that y'all are thinking this, that I leave you thinking I'm intelligent. So now maybe I can feel relevant instead of feeling like a white elephant. <laughs> hey, Google that phrase, white elephant. Now are my brainiac tendencies now evident? Don't y'all like me now that my words are phrased so elegant? Or should I just write from the heart and carry my ass with these embellishments? Mm -hmm. yeah. Teddy bears for sale. Teddy bears for sale. Come get your little brown teddy bear. Come get your little brown teddy bear. Where? You may ask. Over here. If you're in the hood, you know, you can get teddy bears anywhere. Pharmacies, grocery stores, family dollar. Sales go up when we hear families holler. Oh, you thought Valentine's Day was the only time we can't keep them on the shelves. Nah. Black people are like philanthropist gun owners. They can't keep them to themselves. Open up a bear store if what you seek is getting wealth. I can show you how to make money off nothing. We make money off stuffing. We make money off suffering. Check the stock market. <coughs> we in the riches. A pound of cotton and a dozen stitches sit and wait back, wait to see black boy found in ditches. I ain't got to do shit. I just keep watching. Pick a bear from build a bear, but I thought niggas ain't like picking cotton. But look, look, they just keep flying out of the stores. Black people keep killing each other. It's like y'all at war. So shit, money, I just keep making more. Little brown bears, I just keep making more. They'll be posted up on street poles and corner stores. So how many more can I put you down for an order for? How many more family members y'all planning on erasing? Oops, I mean replacing with little brown teddy bears that won't be around next year. I tell you what, I got a special going on. Buy one bear, get a balloon free. Get a pink balloon that matches the RIP Airbrush t shirt of your little niece. I look for pink balloons in the sky. You know why don't you people like to do a balloon release? Because you'd rather release a balloon than release the hatred that consumes the streets. As fast as I love you, I let you go even faster. Crazy, right? One would state that if I could, that my love wasn't real. It's very real, in fact. This I can assure. But I finally realized why you even approached me and my, my third eye is open. 
Thinking back on the second before I said hello, when I didn't even know the pain of you to exist, wanting deeply to go back to that moment instead of add, I should have pressed delete. What? You thought I was so head over heels crazy in love, or maybe thought I was desperate for someone because of the way my life has gone, or that I should stay around and take whatever dish you desired to serve because you felt you were the shh. Who? Me? <laughs> nah, see, I chose to be with you over the other prospects. If I really think about it, you were just an actual chosen project. I have a tendency to want to fix what is broken, and sweetie, you fit the bill. My love for making things better than I found them got me dressing you like a mother does her son. Even teaching you things that can be self-fixed on a car. Sheesh, good thing I only act like a damsel. For if I truly was one, we'd both be stuck. Covering, <laughs> covering your lap to build up your status. Placing you into my world as the one who is destined, please. Reality stepped in and said, child, what are you thinking? You're doing everything for what? Because even his stroke game is lacking. All those sounds I made, if you could play them backwards, you'd actually probably hear me laughing. <laughs> now you could think to say that I was the one who was stupid and let herself get played. Becoming bitter in the process. So these words I spit can't be true. But that could only be if I wasn't playing chess while you were playing checkers. Convenient space was made in my life for you, separating myself from myself just to make you feel insecure. Now that space is gone. Those things I did to build you up, show you better than you had before, a cease and desist order has been placed. That's why you're in my inbox saying, oh, please don't say we're through spinning your redundant game of, I can be all that you need. I'm a changed man, a better man, and it's all because of you. The time for your revelation has passed on by, you see. Yes. Take that what you've earned to the next chick. Maybe she'll treat you bad half as good. Your words have fallen on deaf ears, and you'll never get any more of me. I'm <laughs> period. A baby girl listened, a baby girl listened as her mother sang, just for her. She swam on the whistling notes, in trance, in sync with the wild, dived into the dancing tune, played with the gleeful waves, woven with the whimsical sea. The brutish men brought the boats, ropes, slashing all hopes, brandishing evil intentions wheeled her away from what was her home, her pod, from the beat of her heart. Circling inside the hole like tank, hearing her mother call from the seas, the stabbing longing ran like mercury in her veins. It couldn't be soothed. Whiff of the open seas was a bridge she couldn't cross. She sang and sang and sang. Some could tell that she didn't sing anymore. She cried and cried and cried for five decades and more until the end. The tank is still full with her unfulfilled yearning, wailing her sad song from the wild waters her mama still calls her. She still sings to her baby girl across the horizon. Tokite listens. Rolling down school playing field, summer 89. Me and boy mates land at the bottom, our bodies upside down, our hair in each other's mouths. Feeling giddy, but upside down felt correct way up. <laughs> I am Lee Man. I have the power <laughs> in my bedroom playing with my He-Man, dad playing Dinah Ross downstairs. Boy with sword, but also with wand. How many lines can you fit into a bedroom in a two-up, two-down terrace? 
wallpaper, curtains, lampshade, duvet cover and pillows, all with racing cars in rows and lines in order. Cutting hair off my head, gluing hair onto He-Man. I like what I see on the back page of that week's looking. Upside down, George Michael, you turn me inside out and round and round. <laughs> Song lyrics printed over, dark, hairy chest. Lyrics become lines, become words, become hair. Hair loops and wraps around and through the bodies and holes of printed letters. Through the O, through the P, through the D, through the E. Dissolve, I transgress. Lines of straight male masculinity. My lines are those of enquiry, with every application of mum's black mascara to he-man's freshly glued on eyelashes. I disorder the lines I was born into. Dad and his brothers, fags and footy, <laughs> beers and birds, Turn those lines on their head, upside down and inside out, over washing lines. High up above past the conservatory blinds, at my bedroom desk, I'm learning to draw men in cartoon lines. Mm -hmm. Flat lines over where should be trouser crotch mountain, lines of dickless dolls in Debenhams, redundant <laughs> in end of cell lines, standing in rows and lines watching Disneyland parade. Are you a fairy? the girl asks. I didn't know back then that fairy meant gay. Had she seen me looking at the stitching lines, tracing the steep trouser crotch contours of the aptly named Prince Eric, Mount Everest in his trousers, voice in my head, I can see your Eric Sean. Cute little front hair quiff. Overtook my attention as he spoke so conceptually during art school crits about his latest latex tubes hung like limp Eric Sean's. <laughs> Upside down, George Taylor turned me inside out and round and round. Thought at the time attending art school was about the art scene, getting in, until I realised it was all about me coming out. Both George's, Taylor and Michael, all over my teenage scrapbook in 96. Hair stories and charcoal drawings. In amongst the fishing huts in Hastings, looking over at George with his new girlfriend, whilst I listened to Older on CD. Lost touch with George, crossed wires or broken telephone lines. The closest I next come to feeling upside down was Berlin, 99, George Basilitz painted nudes. Well hung men hung well on gallery walls <laughs> when, when right way up meant upside down, dissolve. These paintings transgress art historical pictorial composition. I leave Basilitz and head to the nightclub, turn my body upside down with hairy homo cubs and bears. I stand before Basilitz again in Vienna this year. I am now much older than George Michael when he released Older in 96. Does that now make me elderly? or just wiser. Like Basilitz bodies, I do know that one day I will also dissolve with only a single strand of my hair turned grey remaining in a world where upside down is turned wrong way up by the ignorant but dominant few. Mm. Thank you. because Prince Charming was too late. My innocence was lost and I was already awake. Because my chariot turns into a pumpkin at midnight 
And it's too easy to lose glass slippers when you're trying to beat the clock. So I lace mine up now because I'm going to have to walk. Because knights in shining armor need damsels in distress to justify their existence. And my knight needed more help than me. So I bandaged up his cracked bloodied armor and set him free. Because I'm seen as the lioness who can hunt her own prey. So no one asks me if I ate today. Because home is a war zone. But it's the war I know. So I'll click my sneakers three times to get back there. Because paradise ain't taking no refugees. Because war said the world is a ghetto. And they were right. Because we see the green grass on the other side, but never the shit that fertilized it. Because there is nowhere else to go that doesn't require struggle. Because there is no glory without the battle. Because the babies won't have a choice but to make a difference in this world that we're trying to get away from. Because I saw a rose grow up through the crack in the concrete. Because hope is all I've got and my optimism is keeping me up. Because for every no, every turn down, every shutout I get, I see four more ways I can do it better. Because without vision, the people perish. Because I've piggybacked off the shoulders of my ancestors and I owe them this much. Because I'm tired but not defeated. So I search to find my crack in the concrete. Because I'm that weed fear couldn't kill. Because my super cape is tested but not torn. Because I have a chance to do it better today than I did yesterday. Because a sliver of daylight shined down on me through that break in the clouds. So I'll be my own superhero. Because I'm the one who can. Because I was made for this. I saved something for you. I put it away on a shelf, away from any danger, <clears throat> away from possible catastrophic ending. I wanted it to heal a while before I let it out into the world again, before I shared it, let it receive likes, dislikes, the love button, or any comments we wouldn't agree with or understand. Sometimes you forget how valuable something that you possess is after it's been damaged, after it's been trampled upon, not appreciated by the select few you chose to share it with. Now having it back, it has to regain its value. So I saved it. I'm going to cherish it this time. Nurture it back to its vibrant and infectious self. Protect it, hide it from the unworthy. Detach what I thought to be treasure holders. Draining, we've learned lessons. So the next time around, I won't be so blind. I deserve that. Decided to pour into it with each prayer, each poem written, each apology owed to someone I wronged. Each time I had to ask for forgiveness with therapy, a few good books, a few good blunts, some time alone. Even though boredom sometimes create waves of unwanted thoughts, I've had time to know how to discard them properly. Because when you look in the mirror and shame overshadows the beauty that you are supposed to feel, then how can you effectively share that with someone else and expect them to see anything different? No one can operate long off desire if they haven't built the proper habits to stay consistent. You have to regroup, re-energize, meditate, create new ways of positivity, get back on your knees, try again, try again, and again, and again. Thoughts and actions will follow, but keep trying again. You may stumble, you may feel the strength of two hands lifting you up if you pray out those slums and that depression freeing you from that anxiety because you deserve it. Stay diligent, perseverance, that's just nothing It's easy to get. Yes, those are just a couple of your characteristic traits, but the most important one of them all is to believe in yourself. That is the one thing that will always strengthen your own faith.
bang of the door, bang on your head, bang the concussion, bang, you feel dead. It hurts at the time, but the real pain waits. The soft pain, the subtle pain that throbs weeks, months, years. A pain that won't end. Bang of the door, bang on your head, bang the concussion, bang, you feel dead. There is no sweetness in your sweet bread. Kindness was not on the menu. Truce restraining order already filed by advertising. Designed to keep us in the dark the very way we keep our victims. Happily in compliance, we draw smiles on the faces of those whose milk and babies we, we stole. stole. So our cartons sell. So our bellies fill. With the delicious taste of self-deception. The Laughing Cow brand spreadables because having your babies killed is hilarious. Our cruelty now self-certified self as humane. The feel-good labels like your Oscar Mayer are nothing but baloney. baloney. Shepherds pie the way a good shepherd tends their flock as they lead them to slaughter. Pretending we care. Pretending party franks were a party for those slowly simmering. Dogs in a sweater, pigs in a poncho, or cozily snuggled in a blanket. Because isn't their death cute when you dip it in mustard? A side of hush puppies like we didn't make all the animals. Hush. Chicken a la king if the king in question were Louis the Sixteenth, Head rolling like theirs onto the ground. Happy family as the animals gather to celebrate their glorious reunion in brown sauce. Triple delight sounds better than triple murder. Bangers may sound fun, but they are all blood sausages. Any moons over your hammy went dark long ago. Sunny side up because the side facing down is where the blood drips. Chicken breasts, chicken wings, conveniently missing the S apostrophe so we can deny they had previous ownership. Dropping by the billions, billions. to the daggers of our callous disregard. After all, we still pride ourselves in killing the maximum number of birds with the minimum stones. I know I can't have it for long, so please, just let me hold a little bit of your love. I'll pay it back with interest. My interest ain't ever shift no chameleon in this blood. My eyes could have gone anywhere, but they were captured by your gravity, the gravity of love's magnitude, swept away by your soft smile. Fuck, man. Sometimes, I wish I never saw you, because now the bar is you, and no one can touch the throne I set up for you, encased in glass, a blooming rose made temporal loop, and I get to see your petals dance forever, I beast. I waiting, I could go, I longing for a long time, for a fortnight, every full moon shit. I love you like a month of Sundays, but we've been here before. Been lip to lip and us gotta stay dead, cause ain't no spark to jump our fusion. I think we could have been nuclear, ushered in a new generation of warm homes to come back to every night. I will always be a porch full of welcome signs for you to come in. I will always be a mantle of candlelight. I will always hold the shape of you on my lips and as fleeting as lightning is, I beg it to strike again. One more flash. One more frozen moment in electricity so we can see every corner of our passion buzz and spark and static embarrass the shadows with all our light making eclipse blush the way we touch and covered one another the interplay of light and shadows the duality of two tongues and a whole night with nothing to do with each other. But I can't hold a second up. It slips through fingers. 
Too fleeting to be anything but a memory blowing in the wind. We are dust in the wind now, tumbling out of alignment. We bumped out of alignment. We orbit out of alignment. The wheel cuts because of alignment. And what are we going to do with all these tangents? We ended. We ended. Like good books. Like your favorite movie. Like a kiss you wish could have lasted just a little longer. My name is Teresa Davis. I am from Atlanta, Georgia, and I am going to share a poem, maybe two. I don't know. This is called The Keeper of the Keys. I kissed you on a dare, your mouth blood orange delicious, the tilt of your head. You looked at me like conquest. This novice heart breaking conformities, never kissed a girl before, never want to not kiss a girl again. The skin, a waving flag of surrender. Hands exploring curves undiscovered. My pulse in your ear. I want it to feel everything. Taste you. Hold my breath mermaid through your veins. You once told me you wanted us to never stop. I believed you back then. I left my inhibitions on the floor with the rest of my clothes. Made myself marionette as you strung me along. The soundtrack of us bang so loud in my head, I mistook multiple orgasm for devotion, lies for truth, took my self-esteem for granted. The magic that was your palm at the base of my spine dipped in mixed messages, poor communication. That time, I waited all night for nothing to happen. No sightings, no call, the dirt of neglect between my teeth, how easily I accepted your excuse while reaching for the blade in my back, knowing you could fuck it out of me if you wanted to. Believing us more than sex and torn sheet caused more damage than I thought possible, pretending not to taste the other women on your skin, not to hear the shudders that moaned names not mine, thinking I needed to change myself, be a different version of the woman you never wanted in the first place. But I kissed you on a dare. Your mouth, blood orange, delicious. If I had simply stated the truth, that I only wanted to kiss you, the lie that became us would never have found its way between my lips. Thank you for listening. What word do you call a widowed womb? Veloma. Babies breath flowers on caskets of babies who've taken their last breath and first days of school become last far sooner than school year calendars intended. Attendance records permanently altered. Time stood still and so did police officers because serving and protecting your own interests are orders taken directly from higher ups. The answer to protecting us from guns is more guns. Just like the answer to protecting us from violence is more violence. So little kids learn open fire drills before they even learn to read. There are not enough flowers in the world that can brighten up a funeral home that houses a child who is on their final walk home. A room in her home now sits absent. Picking out your child's first day of school outfit feels much different than picking out their last a mother's childless hug. Learning to wean herself off motherhood comes in waves like hunger, in waves like tears, in waves like crashing, in waves like silence, like uncontainable laughter lost forever in echoes. Wide toothless smiles that say cheese and try not to blink in class photos. No mug shots with rap sheets with past forlorn. Aren't these the perfect victims you asked for? Republican lawmakers making change off of never making changes that bankroll their lifestyles off the lives of the lifeless. Turns out, deaths don't protect from tornadoes or domestic terrorists. Hugs only felt through ghost pains, 
A mother's heart ripped in shreds. Imagery is only okay in poetry when it's just imagery, when no one is actually doing the dying and fire drills aren't police sirens and we can pretend not to hear and to take the audio out of video so that we don't have to listen to the screams of helpless babies because if 21 victims die in a school building and no cop comes to save them, did they ever really make a sound? Did it ever really make a difference? Ghost pains wrapped tightly around a mother's vocal cords that used to love lullaby and sweet baby her sweet baby's names before they were printed on eulogies and screamed into tombstones and came to fix with thoughts and prayers but never movement or action backpacks don't make for good bulletproof vests maybe that's why they're not allowed in schools anymore the NRA sponsoring class field trips to the cemetery where wombs are widowed and window panes won't be held together by Elmer's glue and police tape that does a really bad job of containing the engorged screams and shards of life and broken hearts all over the floors and mothers who can't stop being mothers even though they stop being mothers and Veloma and they can't and Veloma and they can't and Veloma. There is no one word in the English language that defines a person who has lost a child. So instead we use the word Veloma, which is Sanskrit for empty or against the natural order of things. She has not been killed or otherwise bodily injured in the fleeing from her home, finding shelter and freedom elsewhere, behind the other line. She is tired, hungry, cold and frightened, and her young soul knows just enough to say, these will hurt as long as you remember. Still, seated in a broken church, she is old enough to keep faith for better days, for years full with love and grace and joy. And so she folds her hands, says an honest prayer of thanks for the simple meal she received, the overlarge, worn, warm coat, both from a stranger without asking. I used to make lovers out of rock and sand who loved my body, but hearts, they never lent. Last night I tore them up, ripped them apart like they were nothing but dead weight. Picking out the perfect snapdragon to mark where those half loves lay, each petal a silent witness to hollow embraces, nights filled with whispers that faded by dawn. Their promises, like mirages, vanished in daylight, leaving me with only echoes and a chill. So I lay these snapdragons, a garden of memories, a testament to what was and what could never be. In their bloom and wither, I find a bittersweet truth, love, sometimes it's just a fleeting shadow. My name 
name is Galaxy. I'm the second of five children, about five feet tall, and my weight fluctuates anywhere from zero to 100 pounds on any given day. I'm just over 30 and I've never written a poem about myself. I have more alias than a private investigator, more profile pics than a man with three side chicks, and I still don't know exactly who I am. I've had more trauma than Grey's Anatomy, more death than Annalise Keating. I've had more out-of-body experiences than Casper in some days. I still don't know what's real or not. For years, I've mastered the art of change, learned to fit, learn to follow, learn to shrink myself into whatever box would have me disappear. So instead of finding myself, I became a chameleon, mm. distorting my body to fit inside of groups I was never meant to be a part of, crawling into relationships willing to change everything about myself. So people fell in love with the idea of me. Yeah. I've been called a muse more times than I can count, placed on pedestals as royalty than used and abused more than a hand-me-down button. January 4th. I'm a Capricorn. I was born two weeks late according to my mom, so it's no surprise that I've always felt just a little bit behind. Being born second, I've been a follower my whole life. And lately, it seems like it's been nothing but the blind leading the blind. And for some reason, my personality seems to always get left behind. So I've been navigating, trying to find my life mission. I mean, I've been trying to find my 2020 vision and all of a sudden there was a crash. He said he wanted to get to know me and I wondered how I could introduce him to someone I didn't even know myself, but I still said yes, I guess. Oh, I just see how things go. So I go to my closet and dress and whatever personality I plan on bringing to our first date and distort my mouth to make sure that the hurt and trauma looks great. He didn't want to wait, so we began a date. And I guess everything was going straight. And then he told me that he loved me. And I asked him, have you ever loved a piece of broken glass with blood spilled across the pieces of river, a rainbow from my tears? I didn't feel worthy because I hadn't picked the pieces up myself. He told me that only broken glass makes beautiful cathedrals that the pain from my past only created a more beautiful picture that he could see the constellations in my scars. He told me, baby, when you can't see, let me be your context. When your glasses are broken, take me and let me be that vision. You need to see yourself a little bit more clearly. Follow me and let me be that piece you need to feel a little less incomplete. So now when he tells me that he loves me, I believe him because he was the first man that had the courage to see me before I had the courage to see myself. Thank you.
That's the sound of the cuffs on you. Locking the wagon shut on you. Still make sharp in the shape like a DJ to cut on you. But why? Well, because of car parts, food you eat, lingerie, blue jeans, park benches, picnic table, police equipment used to put past prisoners back inside of me, Walmart, Sprint, JC Penny. There's just a short list of everything that benefits because of who's inside of me. I don't care about morality. I got capitalism and greed residing on both sides of the family. You want to hear a secret? Act like y'all know what I'm talking to y'all. You want to hear a secret? Yeah. yeah. Before I was named prison, I was named slavery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nigga, I ain't going nowhere. I've been here. I'm the one that brought the blood, the sweat, and the tears. I'm the one that kept humanity going. They tried to bring slavery. I became a phoenix. It was reborn in America. Oh, America's my favorite. I brought up the chattel slavery so the masters would stay captives as humans. That's the new wave. But y'all niggas still try to abolish me. Just couldn't behave. Thought that 13th Amendment would put me in a new grave. Nah! What the 13th Amendment was making them a criminal first. That's how you turn them into a new slave. But you really thought slavery was over, huh? Well, I got bad news. You thought Kanye was tripping when he said it was a choice? Hell yeah, it's a choice, nigga! You just ain't the one who chooses. And I'm greedy, got a for that black blood too. That's why if you take everyone that's not black outside of prison, you can't tell if I'm half empty or half full. But you think I'm here to lock up criminals? When the real crooks run the companies, I please. You think this rehabilitation? When I kill niggas for I let them be free? You ain't seen the statistics? Only a matter of time for you and me meet. You ain't heard. Prison got too many bars. That don't let a nigga battle me. When was the last time you saw a trigger warning before a black boy died in prose? When was the last time you saw a trigger warning for a black boy? When was the last time you saw a warning for a black boy? When was the last time you saw a black boy in prose? When was the last time you saw a black boy? When was the last time a black boy died? Was a trigger a black boy? He was a boy. He was prose. He died. We saw a black boy die. He was the last warning. When was the last time you saw a black rose? When was the last war for a black boy? Even still, there's this. As I drove in the rain, past sidewalks covered with grass, broken glass, garbage filled lots, boarded houses, I glimpsed a black boy. His lips curled to his ears, his chest open, his arms extended, his hands palm up, catching raindrops as if each were candy as he stood tiptoe on the top step of his dilapidated porch with no fear of falling. Thank you. Mm. My friend says it's a cartoon because of the way he always bounces back. Like Wiley e. Coyote still running mid-air as the cliff face recedes, stage right. Despite the signs saying uh-oh and the eventual drop, he will always be okay in the next scene. And it's true. I have seen him fall down a flight of stairs, hit his head on the pavement and jump up unscathed, a wry grin on his face, a twinkle in his eye and a pint at least half full still in his hand. Or, or maybe it's half empty. 
The people around him call him a legend. Shout, spillage is a leakage, as he tongues his hand clean. Chant how he's a hero, but they don't see what I see. When their backs turn, as a sharp intake of air through gritted teeth. That smile is so lopsided you could almost see the grimace just for a second before he's off and grinning when his friends call him a cartoon again. I, I worry he started to believe them. Like he's drawing their attention for all the wrong reasons, the failed stick of Acme dynamite that lights but doesn't go off until the audience is gone. His face is backfire, sucked in through well-practiced comic routine. Daffy Duck pulling his blown backwards beak back round at the front and taking the brunt of a hit that would have dropped most of us to the cutting room floor. Every time it happens, the stunt of being someone else's ruined plan, his smile takes a little longer to come back. Those bones ache for an extra day, that memory fades away a little more easily, and the regret it takes hold a little more deeply. In moments of clarity, he has told me he drinks the same reasons that I used to. He just he doesn't know how to do it any other way. Waking up every day is this unforgiving maze and only stops hurting when you're not looking for an honest way out. I have held him as he cried five days into a three-day bender, passing off comments about jumping from Clifton Suspension Bridge as jokes, like he really could walk on air without falling right away and the audience would still be there laughing as it happened. In those moments, all you can say is... Yeah. Yeah, I know. But today, when I put my arm around him, he shrugs it off and asks me all slobber and slur. When are you going to drink again? Like a laugh track suddenly muted, my patience went flat. My composure must have cracked my own smile, gone upside because his slid off completely. But I can see what he's really asking me. He's asking me to sign his demise by proving there is no light, only tunnel that it was painted on all along so we can pancake into it together with the words do not resuscitate, dripping from our pint glasses, anything to blur the pain that he thinks he hides so well. He wants proof there is no hope because things don't get better. They never get better, not for people like me, and not for people like him. Right now, he is both the wounded bear with its six foot of heavy muscle, angry with claws the size of a dinner for one, and the steel jaws clamping him to the ground, pounds per square inch, long teeth drawing blood, all at the same time. As if that image would be any less tragic if sketched out instead of acted. This is, this is the poem that in the book is kind of a flippogram, but I want to use it to tell a story. I, I want to tell a story in the fashion of the West African griots. I want to tell a story in the fashion of renewal, in the fashion of resilience and brilliance and genius. Uh, I want to tell the story of the come up and the get back and the getting over. I want to tell a story of Nina Simone, I want to tell a story of James Baldwin. I want to tell a story of Maya Angelou. I want to tell a story of Prince and the story of Muhammad Ali. I want to tell a story that spans time. I want to tell a story that flies. I want to tell a story that is the arts, that is artistic renewal. I want to tell a story that's tonight. I want to tell a story that's you. I want to tell a story that's you. I want to tell a story that's us. I want to tell a story that starts just like legends say. Africans once soared through the sky like blackbird. But once enslaved and brought to America, they forgot their wings, forgot how to fly. One day, legends say, Massa look up and seen black bodies floating right out the field. One by one, a cloud of freedom, a black rapture caught up in glory. This poem be North Star, 
Big Dipper, be slave song, be map to free, disguised as spiritual. This poem be amen. Oh yeah, this poem be black. But when I say black, I'm saying, I'm saying this poem be black as you can handle. Got wings too. Travel from Massa's Field to my grandfather's sharecrop shanty. From there to Selma, Montgomery, Cleveland, Little Rock. From there to Baltimore, Ferguson, Charlotte. From there to Fish Fry by the Lake. Cook out, be all legs when Frankie Beverly and Mays come on. Be my Uncle Skin slumped in a chair after a big dinner. Be me beaten on lunch tables at Conway Middle School. Be Miranda, protest, riot, cuffed and clipped. Be woke ain't the same as woke, Mama say. When that day come, your wings gonna spread wider than an archangel with a smile to match. I say, Mama, how I'm gonna smile and open my back to the wind at the same time. She say, boy, don't you know you can fly? change, become something else entirely. The problem is reaction to change always been violent, always been chase and hound and water hose. Reaction to change always been. Now why you want to go and do that, foe? Why you want to go and mess up a good thing? Why you won't not be satisfied with what we gave you? See, we never should have gave y'all nothing. What are we going to do about Harlem but take it back? What we going to do about Black Wall Street but burn it down? What we going to do but tell you what we going to do and then do it and then ask you what you're mad for? Ain't you grateful? We be grateful for Fannie Lou Hamer, for Rosa Parks, my Aunt Chloe, Aunt Hesse, for Mama, for all the black women that made it possible for us to fly in the first place. We be grateful for Solange and Viola and Lupita and for Tank and the Bangers and for me and you, your mama and your cousin too. Oh yeah, this poem be black. But when I say black, I mean resilient. When I say black, I mean love. When I say black, I mean, I mean fly. When I say black, I mean we can't be owned. When I say black, I mean a resilient love that can fly on its own because every black poem really just be a love poem. Be I love you. Be I love myself. Be we gonna make it this time like we make it every time. And if they ask you how we did it, the answer is not love, it's heart. Not steadfast, it's shift. Not intention, it's movement. Not a wall, it's Jericho. The answer to any question is not a trump that raises a wall, but a trumpet that brings one down. What heart? Where shift? When now? Why movement? Who Joshua? What ram horn? Why fall? What release? Wait, who? if this the plantation, who left the gate open? Look at, look at this view. How we get up so high after being brought so low, cover so much ground. Ain't we beautiful? Oh yeah, you got wings. You all got wings. Just because they've forgotten or called home or cuffed or clipped don't mean, don't mean, don't mean you ain't been flying. This whole time. Okay. 
sleepless, can't let depression catch me Red and blue lights, I can't see them, test me Guarantee my blood is human being, speeding Tears in my eyes, it ain't the drugs, it's the love If you built a filthy, then you know the cut Fear, don't know why y'all here, I can't stop Chasing, broke a tail like the first block Racing, wondering if it's hope for a lost soul Ten seconds, jumping out the car, don't know where I'm going Twenty seconds, pop, pop, thirty seconds, pop, pop, four, sixty, nine, my God Pop, pop, 30 seconds, pop, pop, 40, 60, 90, pop, God. Blue lights flashing and it looks like maybe 